This week, episode 304 of Stogie Geeks, we interview Aaron Goldfarb. He is a writer, a journalist, and an author. His writing about drinking culture has appeared in Esquire, Punch, Vine Pear, Whiskey Advocate, and Stogie Geeks. We're going to learn some super cool concepts, which you can do with your whiskey, of fat washing and infusing. We're going to talk a little bit about Pappy Van Winkle, how sometimes the groupies or droopies think they're drinking Pappy Van Winkle, and they might not be. And after, in our second segment, Drew and I are going to talk Sticks of the Week. I got my Bloody Mary. I'm fired up. It all happens right here on episode 304 of Stogie Geeks. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geek Show. Joe and I are already silly. Oh yeah. yeah. Joe Hosempa, a.k.a. Joe Hollywood is here with me in studio. I'm fired up. And- Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Confidence. Confidence isn't walking into a room with your nose in the air, thinking you're better than anyone else. It's walking into a room and not having to compare yourself to anyone in the first place. Welcome to episode 304 of Stogie Geeks. I am your host, Joe Hozeppa. I am joined via Zoom. We have Drew over from Texas. Drew, how's it going? Okay. Drew, you're muted. So we have Aaron Goldfarb. He how's is, it going? <laughs> uh, how's it going? He, Aaron, you are a writer, a journalist, and an author who wrote one hell of a book called Hacking Whiskey. And I cannot wait to hear all about it. For you Stogie Geeks listeners, um, if you go to stogiegeeks.com forward slash 304, you can find all the information and a link to Aaron's website. And also in our second segment, What Sticks of the Week, that Drew and I are going to be talking about. So you can uh, follow along. Uh, Drew, are are you back on the mic? Yes, sir. All righty. We fixed that problem. Awesome. Drew, welcome. How's everything going? Everything's going great here in the state of Texas. The weather's great. Cowboy season is just about to get in full swing. Tomorrow's our first uh, game for the uh, preseason here at home. So, oh yeah, yeah, we everybody's had, excited. Yeah, the Patriots had theirs uh, yesterday, and 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 I don't know a preseason. I actually sat and watched the game. I I, I love watching football. You know, it gives yeah. me a chance to catch up on some of my work as well. Right. <laughs> you know, and, same, and, same and, here. and stuff like that on the computer and, 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 you know, and, and I don't know, like fall is my being here in New England, uh, here in the Northeast. I love fall. I love shorts and sweatshirt weather. I'll take yeah. it all the time. Uh, it's cigar smoking weather. And then I love it when you change the clocks back and it gets darker and then it goes to, you know, the, you got a little Halloween and then you got Thanksgiving and then you have your holiday rush Right, right after January 5th, though, I'm like, okay, I want summer. Let's go. And then I ended up waiting five weeks, uh, <laughs> five, five months for it. Kind of sucks, you know, but what are you going to do? Right. Maybe, maybe I'll take a trip over to Texas over the winter. It's warm over there, right? Oh, yeah. Is it warm over <laughs> We have golf change? here 24 7. I know. So I know. golf over here never see, uh, never ceases. Do you golf, so too? Oh, yeah. Oh, golf geeks. There we go. Mm-hmm. Next week, Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is the first episode <laughs> of Golf Geeks. Anyway, uh, uh, Drew, we get to interview Aaron Goldfarb. Yes, very interesting uh, 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 book that we uh, both got to read. Uh, wow, yeah, that's all I, I mean, can say. I mean, I, I and 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 I, Aaron, welcome to Story Geeks. How are you, sir? Great, thanks for having me. No, thanks for 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 allowing us to uh, grab you in. Um, you wrote a book, Hacking Whiskey. Now, 
um take us through like how you started that book and and like what where that was within your rotation of some of the writings that you have done in in your career and how you got started along with some of the other appearances that you've had as well yeah well you know i always kind of had a a divided career i kind of wrote novels when i wrote books and then kind of my day job was was writing alcohol journalism and I kind of figured, you know, I, I was never going to write a, a uh, alcohol book. I thought, well, there's a lot of those out there. I'm not sure if I need to add to the pile. Mm. But I, you know, one, one of my expertises, if I have one, is, is on, you know, kind of the geekier aspects of whiskey, what the, what the real underground is doing, um, you know, geeks online, you know, people in their mother's basement, uh, even some of the stranger uh, bartenders and distilleries out there. So I'd written a lot of articles on these concepts over the last five years. And a publisher came to me, uh, Dovetail Press, and asked if I, I thought I had a whiskey book in me. And, you know, quickly doing the math, I thought, well, maybe I could just compile all these things I've already written and get paid a second time for them. <laughs> uh, <That's awesome. laughs> so I so I accepted the deal, and uh, I quickly realized uh, I was going to have to do a ton of writing uh, additionally. But uh, that's how we uh, ended up with uh, this book I've gratuitously placed over my shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, have, haven't had a chance to go through the book, right? And I, I definitely want to take some time out and talk about fat washing and infusing. Right. Yeah. Also, the wasting component. Right. And and <laughs> and, and and you bring up a uh, some, you bring up a great point of it's that underground. Right. I mean, I along with so, which is probably how I got started within Stogie Geeks. Right. Was I I love that underground stuff. Right. Like if yeah. you if you if you if you want if you are taking a survey of Joe Hosempa, right, or AKA Joe Hollywood here on Story Geeks, if you're talking music, like I love country, right? Music, but I love underground country. Like Wayne the Train Hancock is like my I is 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 my guy. You know what I mean? I love mm -hmm. how it's kind of underground. I love the rockabilly scene, which a lot of people say it's dead. It's gonna, never going to die, right? Rock and roll is here to stay, right? So you know, <laughs> you know, and 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 it's just like like I love that underground aspect of the music. There are some other, you know, even if it crosses over into hip hop, right? Love the underground stuff. Right? Oh, yeah. When I was younger, you know, loved uh, Boogie Down Productions and KRS One, and and and, oh, yeah. and 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 you know. Uh, having went to Berkeley College of Music, took a class with Chuck D. That was an amazing class. Took a class with Gloria Stefan. I know I'm switching genres, but that was an amazing class as well. And Gary Hoey, which a lot of people don't don't know who Gary Hoey is, but uh, when Tony Iommi had passed from um, uh, Ozzy's group, uh, Black Sabbath, uh, Gary Hoey was second to... Uh, Zach Wild, so he was his second choice. So if you look up G Gary Hoey, and so anyway, I love those underground stories in music, right? Clearly in cigars, which is why I'm on Stogie Geeks. I love the underground stories, right? Craft beer. Uh, if you're following me on Facebook or Twitter, I I am at at least a brewery every other week. Uh, love the craft beer aspect. Love the alchemy aspect of it. Your book breaks that down. So you know, and and and. To be honest with you, from my perspective, I've never had a chance to really consider like that whiskey culture. Um, can you explain that to me? Like that whiskey mixing culture. I mean, I, I drink whiskey. I like it, but I've never taken it to that level on a personal level. Yeah, well, you know, the, the culture kind of comes together because when you get to the the level of a guy like me and i'm nowhere in the you know 99th percentile there's much bigger geeks than me and you have a house full of thousands of bottles and you you've drank all the great bottles you start searching for more you know how much fun is it to try pappy again how much fun is it to try george t stag again um, and maybe you don't even have bottles. You have some bottles you dislike. So you start thinking, well, I wonder if I could create my own one of a kind, uh, whiskey. And that kind of has, has spawned a real amateur blending culture. Um, in the book, I talk about this guy, um, he's, he's anonymous. I know his name, but sure. and a lot of, a lot of people know his name, but he's not mentioned in the book by his name. Uh, he's just, uh, you know, I believe he's a 50 something salesman in, in California 
And he's got a great palate, and he started mixing uh, several bottles together, and he'd send it to his friends across the country. Uh, it's called California Gold, and it started developing a cult following. This guy's amateur blend is better than a lot of the professional uh, releases out there. So now there's a, a, a secondary black market for California Gold, where yeah, I, I don't know what it cost him to to blend a bottle, sure. but it's going for a few hundred dollars online, and <laughs> you know, if, if fifteen thousand bottles of Pappy fifteen are released per year, this guy makes you know twenty four bottles of California Gold per year. So talk about you know a rarity that the geeks crave, and yep. you know most people that have had it do indeed like it better than almost anything else you can buy on the market. Mm -hmm. what's what's actually in it even i don't know and I, I i've you know i'd consider myself a bit of a personal friend with this guy people have their guesses but again no one really knows and he claims he's going to take it to the grave with him so you know there's real stories like that that are fun you know y you guys know when there's when there's something only you can have only you and 20 people on planet earth can have uh, and no one else can get – you almost want it more than the, the bottle of Pappy that as long as you have $1,500, you can buy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and the, with social media, that is a huge aspect now of, of – it makes it kind of underground and then has it go out. Like uh, Like I've been to whiskey bars and had different various – their signature whiskeys, and, and obviously I frequent – some of the, some of the scotch shops when I'm on travel and have their you know either whiskey or scotch, not because you're on the show. I've said this previously. I'm whiskey over scotch. Uh, I know that yeah. I think that's like a cigar taboo. You know what I mean? But you know, I, like I prefer whiskey over scotch. But I do drink scotch, and you know, it, it it's one of those it's one of those things where you know, um, are there really? real underground bars that are not you know like if you go to a casino or if you go to like a tourist destination are there really underground bars that really just focus on like the whiskey stuff and that underground alchemy or is it really really underground with like clubs and people just kind of experimenting yeah i mean you know everyone's heard of modern speakeasies but you know how much of a speakeasy is it if you know a place like pdt in manhattan if, i would guess they have fifty thousand instagram followers you know everyone on, everyone on planet earth knows about it yeah, yeah um you know the the best whiskey bars in america these days are in in people's houses that, yep. that's the fact of the matter um you know again I, i'm not one of new york's great greatest whiskey collectors but my collection is better than just about every every bar in brooklyn um and the dudes that really have collections, it's 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 mind blowing what they have, uh, because you know in 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 cities where people have money, in coastal cities, if a if a bar gets its one or two bottles of something interesting for the year, you know the the Wall Street guys come and just absolutely crush it, and you know <laughs> you, you've you've all seen a social media post. Oh, we just got our pappy in one hour later. Okay, we're out. Sure, um, right. <laughs> Right. So it's these, it's these private bars, these private clubs, these, you know, kind of really rich guys that have set up some sick man caves that, you know, those are the places you want to get the invites. I wish I could make it easy for you and tell you how you get those invites, but uh, I'll let uh, everyone out there figure figure out how, how to get those. But just about every city in America probably has one or two serious, serious collectors. Um, I, I wrote an article a few months ago about this guy, John Brittle in Nashville. He literally rents an entire house for his whiskey collection. No one lives in the house. It's called uh, JB's Whiskey House, and it's it's underground, but people know about it. It's on it's on um, Instagram, JB's Whiskey House. Mm -hmm. And he must have, I don't know, 5,000 bottles, 10,000 bottles. I don't even know. I haven't been there yet. Um, I, I hope to go one day, but you know, th there's no way there's a better whiskey bar in, in Tennessee than that. And there's, there's probably not a better public whiskey bar in Kentucky than JB's Whiskey House. Really? So it really is that that underground where it starts off with clubs and people kind of mixing stuff and then doing stuff, obviously keeping a journal of it. When I've done my my own home brews, I brewed eight home brews. I have exact notes on how to repeat those. I've done eight different ones. I've home brewed quite a bit, but there, there are three or four that I got pretty much spot on, so I just kind of go to those because that's kind of like a pain, you know, and yeah. and... and, and with with the homebrew, once it gets out and it's been boiled and it's been simmered, 
you got to b- before you start to put it into um before you get to the yeast portion you got to get it from 100 change degrees to 74 in like 45 minutes and like here in the northeast it's i do i wait till there's snow and i just brew a bunch and take it outside in the buckets and just put the cover on it and it, within 30 <laughs> minutes it'll go down because if not you got to do the coil and all it's just it's just a pain right so you know I, I don't brew it enough but my point is i have the journal and i'm sure that they're kind of always experimenting with that uh type stuff so uh how did you get started with that you know because it's not one of those things where you know you, 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 you were you a bartender somewhere and you just decided to or, or how'd you get why whiskey and not like something else well <laughs> you know if you came to my apartment you'd see there is a lot of something else here oh, okay. I, I too i too am a big beer geek yep you know I, i'm into cocktails i'm into funky rums and Smoky mezcals and you know really weird amaro. You know I'm a geek. I'm into you know ever since I was a five year old collecting baseball cards. Anything I got a passion for, I needed to have literally every single you know thing available and the best of the best and everything. It's just like something in our our, our DNA, guys like us, right? Um, you know I I'm not a great blender like uh the california gold guy like i talked about i don't do a ton of blending i do make a lot of cocktails at home it's fun you know it's it's a it's a fun thing to do to to do for guests i i've never worked professionally in a bar or or restaurant for a single day uh Mm -hmm. uh much to my much to my shame but uh you know you if you start learning techniques you start watching bartenders you admire how they work uh, and you know, you follow recipes, you can, you can get pretty good at, at, at making drinks and then you can start kind of inventing your own drinks. You know, you go like, well, you know, you know, that Manhattan's too sweet. I wonder what would happen if I swap sweet vermouth for, you know, comp- whatever. Yep. You start figuring out what works, you know, a, a screwed up cocktail is a waste of a few bucks. It's not the end of the world. It's not like, it's not like screwing up a, a slab of ribs or a steak where you've just ruined dinner and flushed a hundred bucks down down the drain it's it's a it's a minor mistake to have to have some fun and you know maybe invent uh the world's next great cocktail yeah absolutely drew do you have a question for aaron no i was just gonna say you know here in dallas i mean we're we're experiencing that whiskey boom now with you know a lot of whiskeys that are uh distilleries here in texas uh and uh it's interesting now that you know there's some little speakeasies opening up in areas in Dallas and Fort Worth. And I mean, they don't even put the name on the, on the, on the, uh, on the building. They just kind of, a uh, mm. dimly lit, uh, you walk into some of these places and it looks like a laboratory, you know, you go yeah. in there and there and everything's mixing or infusions. And it's just pretty, pretty awesome to see that. Uh, I, myself, I, I love, uh, I got into that beer kick for a while of uh, IPAs, the craft breweries, and and I still am. Trust me, I love my love my beers. But uh, man, to walk into some of these places and uh, and and it's not like it has a menu or anything. They just ask you what your likes are, and then they try to and then they combine those together. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah for sure. That's super cool because if you frequent one, Drew, that's a good point. You can you can have a different experience. Oh yeah, you know, and you and, yeah. and the education there too as well. I mean, they're they're willing to uh, a lot of the uh, I, I don't want to call them mixologists because they're beyond that to me. Um, they 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 sit there and they just kind of you know let you taste and then they then they'll go ahead and give you uh, something like a tasting, and 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 then uh, from there you just kind of ed- they educate you and how that process uh, becomes, which is what uh, reading Aaron's book. I mean, just reading those processes and, and and those different chapters um really comes together pretty well in your mind once you see that in person yeah yeah i i want to get into to some of the points in the book do you want to go in order aaron of the book or do you can i jump around uh, yeah absolutely right, go and jump <laughs> around uh, you 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 bring up uh stocking the house and you know getting started and doing that and in and, and there that would be the logical place to start well i'm left-handed I don't want to start there, right? We're going we're gonna to talk about how to get started and how we can start a collection. But I am absolutely fascinated by two chapters in your book. Fat washing. I, I'm sorry, three of your seven chapters. Fat washing, wasting, and infinity bottles. 
So you can choose. Okay. So you can choose. You, you you can go from there. But but like I am actually because because you know uh, some of the other stuff. Sure, you know it 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 does. The book has a great educational component from the the person who's just trying to get into it, and the way you break it out with some of the tidbits and the side columns of the book and how it reads. Super awesome read, right? But like fat washing, I have never. I really had to like like. Is that what I think it is? Like, like I thought it was, and do people still do that? You know what I mean? Because that's like something like my grandfather would like screw around with, like in his garage. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and I, and I was like, you know, am I really showing my age that I even understand that? Like, is that really a thing? Fat washing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not quite as in vogue as it was in let's say 2012, but it, it's still very much a thing and a technique that most big city bartenders are going to know how to do and probably have a, a cocktail or two on the menu that, that, that does it, you know, it, for people in the audience that don't know what that is, that's literally infusing uh, a fat into alcohol. You know, if <laughs> we, we, you want to infuse fruit into vodka, I think everyone knows how to do that. You just put fruit into vodka and, you know, come back a day later and you have, you know, strawberry vodka. Right. But how do you get bacon into whiskey? Mm. You know, you don't just put strips of bacon into whiskey. You don't put the raw strips in. That that probably would lead to uh, disaster, <laughs> trichinosis, yeah. maybe. Um, so what you do is you render fat. You take, you know, you make your bacon in the morning and and you eat your bacon, and then you have fat left in in, in the pan. You dump it into the whiskey or the rum or whatever you want to infuse it into, and then you freeze it. Um, and if you know anything about alcohol, you can't freeze alcohol. So the fat and the alcohol separates mm -hmm. and you you cut off the fat and now you have the flavor uh, and the, the the aroma of the bacon without texture or any weird uh, uh, particles or, or fat in there. And, you know, bacon's the most famous one people do, you know, next time. Next time you make bacon on a Sunday morning and, and you, you kind of have a bottle of whiskey that you're not too happy with, you know, dump that fat into uh, into the, the whiskey bottle and, and throw it in the freezer and, and come back 24 hours later. Um, but really anything you can imagine, you can you can fat wash into into an alcohol. Brown butter is in, in the book. Uh, brown buttered corn uh, whiskey. Um you know, you're probably not going to make a hamburger vodka or something, but you could. You know, you can really <laughs> do whatever you imagine. And, and um, there's some crazy ones out there. There's a foie gras whiskey in the book that a, a guy in Boston um, does. There's bone marrow whiskeys. It's really, you know, anything you can imagine. And, you know, it combines uh, everyone's love of uh, fatty, artery-clogging meats and whiskey. You had mentioned duck in the book as well. Um, oh yeah! Take the Stogie Geek listener, you know, through the process of that, because because I'm thinking, okay, you pour fat and whiskey from the fat, let the fat cool, okay, so you know, you're gonna put it in the freezer. So I'm assuming it shouldn't be a glass jar, right? Because you know, because alcohol doesn't freeze. So like, do you put it in the whiskey bottle? Because I put I put whiskey or Jaeger. I have Jaeger in the freezer right now. I'm a Jaeger fan too. <laughs> uh, it's you know, it goes with with the Rockabilly theme, right? <laughs> I love yeah. Jaeger, right? But but no, like you know, so you get you you get a bottle, all right, uh, and and then you would pour the fat in there, right? Um, is there any type yeah, of ratio? You, you, like I I know it's all experimentation, but like, is there a ratio? Like, is it two pots this, two pots that, or or? How's that work? Yeah, I mean, it's a little tough. You know, how are you going to measure the amount of fat you're going to get out of a 12 pack of bacon? Um, but to, to answer your first question, yeah, don't don't put it back in your in the bottle. I've done that before. And yep. I opened the freezer and the bottom of the whiskey fell out. And now I had bacon whiskey on my feet. Um, so you want to use like a mason jar type thing because um, because you, you're also going to want want something with a with a with a wider neck. So you can pull, pour it either through a, a, a mesh colander or That's a good point. Yeah, for, yeah. For, for particularly tricky uh, fat washes, like uh, say a peanut butter fat wash, you're gonna want to go through like a cheesecloth just to get every every little piece of of, of fat um, out of there. But uh, um, yeah, you know, it, it's th there are you know uh, uh, ratios in my book. I, I think for a bottle of, of bourbon. 
you want about six to eight pieces of bacon and, and take the fat rendered from that. You know, it's kind of a, a feel it out thing. You know, you're not going to use 10 jars of peanut butter for one b- bottle of bourbon, you know, just, you know, maybe a half jar or something like that. But, you know, if you if you want it more peanut butter, you want it more bacony, you want it more buttery, you you up it. But, yeah, these are really experimental things. And you're, you're probably not going to screw it up the first time, but you'll teach yourself things and realize what you can do to really hone it in the next time. I am – all over this like I am all over this fat washing concept I I am beginning to uh, collect like which which bottles I'm gonna try to mess with yeah. I even dug out my uh, I have a journal I have a journal for everything even work right so I, I I dug out my my beer journal and I and I started on on the back end so that they can meet yeah. it, meet at some point right I'm like I'm like so I got this stuff at home right and 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 I was gonna start with uh, the bacon, some something pre- pretty, you know, pretty simple, yeah. right? And and doing that there. So once I get it in the jar, and once I mix my parts, and I go there, it's twenty four hours in the freezer. I mean, it's it's essentially till it's fully frozen and separated. Okay. And you know, you'll when it, it could be as little as twelve hours when you you know put it in and go to sleep and come back the next morning, you'll literally see that thick white fat that right. that. Mm-hmm. you know, solidifies in the pan if you're lazy and don't wash your, your pans after making bacon. And, and you'll see that it's fully separated uh, mm-hmm. at some point. There's there's no exact science again. You'll you'll know when it's when it's done and when you can start straining it. Gotcha. Now, once it's done, right? So once it's done, because I've done I've gone from like vodka to gin and done those kits yeah, yeah. and all of that stuff, right? Super cool yeah. stuff, right? I I love doing that stuff anyway, right? So like, which is why I'm le- I'm leading in with the subject, right? So yeah. so um once it's done, then I pour the whiskey out in a separate bottle, leave the fat. Fat's gone now, right? We're, we're, are we officially done with the fat at that point, or are yes, we just, yeah. or are we just pouring it and serving and then sifting it through something so that there's no fat and enjoy? No, no. You you take your mason jar or whatever you froze it in, mm-hmm. and you know you can scoop the visible fat off and then dump it through you know a, a mesh colander yep. or a a colander you'd use for pasta or, or washing vegetables or whatever. Um, you can even even line the colander with a, a thin layer of cheesecloth just to catch everything. Yeah, um, I was going to suggest but, that because I do the beer stuff, so I was just going to lay the cheesecloth, separate it, and then be done. So once it's separate, then that's it. It's ready to go. Yeah, it's going to, again, go back to being you know as clear as, as it had originally been. And if you put it right back into the bottle, no one would literally know they have a new, a new product until they screwed the cap off and go, wow, why does this Jim Beam smell like bacon? Nice, nice. And then yes. from there... Um, you wouldn't put it back in the freezer. You would just let it go back down the room temperature and as is, right? Yeah, you know, there, there, there is some debate about this. Okay. Um, you, bars go through their fat wash stuff fast enough that they can keep it at room temperature. If you're going to take a few months to drink your bacon bourbon, maybe you want to refrigerate it just so it doesn't go rancid. Uh, I, I've personally never, never seen a fat wash bottle go bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not opposed to keeping it at room temperature, but I know there are people that get a little squeamish like my wife and sure. don't want a, a, a jar of bacon fat bourbon just, just sitting out that anyone could accidentally, <laughs> uh, serve themselves. Mm, mm. Yeah. It reminds me of, uh, there's a place that we frequent ever since we were little kids over on Hilton Head Island, right? Over in South Carolina. And sure. the, just, a, it's a quick ferry ride. It's called, um, the Fusky Island, and they make their own stuff. It's not infused, but it's their own moonshine, and it's only yeah. available there. And, and they teach you how to do it. And like I, so I have all those mason jars from years ago in the Hilton Head, right? I always nice. saved them. So, so I, I, I got the mason jars out. I got the book ready. Uh, I'm, hmm. I'm gonna mess around with it and uh, take some pictures. I'll tag you on social media yeah, as well, and and then I'll do a a, a, a taste and reveal for sure. <laughs> you got to. Yeah, I should also add, and maybe you missed this page, there's a cigar-infused bourbon recipe in the book, too, which might be of interest to you guys. There's a, a, a great restaurant in uh, Cambridge in Boston, uh, Harvest, yes. and they, they, um, they take a grill, a smoker, yep. that you, you typically prepare meat on, and they, they chop up, uh, I think, a Monte Cristo as their, um, as their kindling. 
Uh, they put Buffalo Trace into a kind of hotel pan, close it, light the cigars, and now they have a cigar-infused uh, uh, whiskey, which I think is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Paul Azadorian um, uh, had uh, mentioned on previous episodes that he went to a bar. I'm, I wonder if it's the same bar where they actually, like, smoke the glasses, too. They, they, they have an apparatus where they smoke the glasses and pour some, some, some different infused stuff. I'll, I'll do some research to follow that, too, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a section in the book also on smoking. You can use various devices. The most common one's a device called the smoking gun. It's a it's about a hundred dollar device. It cold smokes, so you can you can do it in your house. It'll, yes. Your yep. your wife will think the house is on fire, but it's <laughs> it's it, it's cold smoke, and it's it's just adding aroma and uh, uh, flavor. And uh, you know, if you have a lot of guests over for a Christmas party, it really adds some uh, uh, sizzle to the party. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, hey Joe. Yeah. Oh, oh no. I was going to add as well. Uh, you know, one of the things on this book that I read that was pretty pretty cool, and a lot of my and a couple of my friends are actually going to go ahead and try to procure these. Are the uh, is the barrels, the barrel picks, the offerings that some mm. of these uh, uh, distilleries offer. Uh, so that kind of brings this uh, experiment together with them. So I was going to ask uh, Aaron. Uh, so do you do you? I guess I guess just to educate the uh, the stogie geek out there who wants to try this at home, uh, can they just call or email them and they buy these barrels? I guess maybe. So single barrel picks have become one of the hottest things for the real geeks yeah. out there. Um, okay. What that is is just what it sounds like: literally buying an entire barrel, and an entire barrel of of bourbon has about about 150 bottles in it. So you go to – if you can get a meeting, <laughs> you go to yeah. Wild Turkey or Buffalo Trace or you know a lot of the guys in Texas, a lot of the smaller guys do it. They offer yes. about two to 400 single barrels a year to customers. Mm -hmm. uh, most of their customers are going to be some of their biggest accounts. They're the biggest liquor stores in town, the biggest bars across the country. Um, if you're an average Joe, you can do it. Uh, you're going to need – someone with a liquor license to back you. Now, okay. here's a here's a wild turkey single barrel pick I did. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Pretty cool. Comes with a hang tag. So what, nice. the, what whiskey geeks really like about this is it, it, it's literally one of a kind. As I just said, you know, it's not going to taste like the standard wild turkey or buffalo trace or whatever. You know, may, maybe you like standard wild turkey, but you'd like a real uh, one that's a little more spicy or a little more sweet or whatever. You know, you, you'll walk around the warehouse and hopefully the distiller will lead you to what you're looking for. Um, OK. And, uh, you know, it's really cool when whenever I'm in a new town, whenever I'm at a new whiskey bar, I, uh, I want to know, do you do you guys have any house single barrel picks? And that's that's usually what I'm most interested in buying over anything else. Yeah, I, I've also drew uh, have an experience with going to a brewery in Seco, Maine called Barreled Souls, where okay. they they only do their craft beer in barrel in barrels. Right. And there's yeah, a whole yeah. process. And, you know, they have a club and, and, and you know, you. Usually, if you can kind of get chummy with the owner and get a club, and and you can kind of get on a, a, a kind of underground list to get right. those barrels. I mean, if you're walking in and never been there before, like yeah, I want to purchase a barrel, it probably might not work. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, right. but but again, like we we've gone there, uh, just happened to talk to people. You next thing you know, it happens to be the owner. Um, having a bit, being a business owner myself, I can l usually spot out the owner, you know, <laughs> right. he, he or she's the one who's not really working, but they're kind of walking around the place, you know, yeah. if you got the bartenders going all like this and trying to pour the beer, they, they might not be the owner, right? <laughs> you, Correct. Know, the, you know, the, 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 the guy, a girl who's kind of giving one of those, yeah, yeah, yeah. How's everything going? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Everything cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one you want to kind of talk to. And then you like, again, there's kind of like that social aspect you, you, you can get on there and whatnot or with the birth of social media. I mean, I, I, I just ask. You know right. what I mean? If I really wanted something, I would try to find the owner and try to find the owner's profile and, and ju just flat out ask. And, you know, and sometimes it's yes. You know? Yeah. I think the Stogie Geeks should do their own single barrel. Um, in I'm, all I'm, honesty, you know. <laughs> would love to. <laughs> none of the – these days, if you're just an average Joe off the street – the, the the big boys in Kentucky, they have waiting lists, so you're not going to get one of those. Sure. Go go to your local craft distillery. Yes. Yep. Um, there you go. As he said, buddy up with the owner. 
they're going to be you're, you're doing them a favor too because you're taking five to ten thousand dollars worth of whiskey off their hands with one check so right it, it's not that they're necessarily doing you a favor but um you know it's a, it's a great fun thing to do and there's really nothing cooler than saying you know this is my barrel of whiskey yeah yeah um, nice. um I would love to get to that to 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 that level. Like like when you sent me your book on the e version, I actually went out and got it. Like I'm like I'm like I am all over this. This is so cool. Uh, I, I just I, f I find it fascinating. Take us through Infinity Bottles. Infinity Bottles kind of goes back to our discussion of amateur blending. It's it's kind of it's kind of the laziest form of amateur blending. Um, it's 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 literally. It's kind of a dump bucket you drink, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you have two ounces left in a bottle of whiskey and you need to create space in your house. You dump it into a, a, a bottle or a decanter. You have another two ounces. You do that. You just keep dumping things in there. Maybe you have a plan. You say, I'm only dumping my favorite bourbons I've ever tried. Uh, maybe you're only dumping crap in there. A guy like me gets sent so many samples that distilleries want me to try and write about that I, I needed to create space. Mm -hmm. Now it's called an infinity bottle because it never ends. Mm. You, you, you have your, thir your 25 ounces of infinity bottle, you drink an ounce, you pour an ounce back in there, it goes on forever. And if someone says to you, wow, this is the, the greatest whiskey I've ever tasted, what's in it? You say, hell if I know, I started four years ago, there's hundreds of things in it. Mm. And uh, yeah, I forget what that law is where if you, if you walk halfway to a wall, you can in theory never get to the wall. Mm. If, if, if It's kind of like the Solera process. Even if you only put one ounce of something in there four years ago, you, it, until you finish the bottle, you're, there's always going to be 0.001% of that first thing in there. And th there's dudes out there that have, in, have had, had infinity bottles for 30 or 40 years. Wow. Uh, there, there's this uh, YouTuber, Ralphie. He's this Scottish guy who lives on the Isle of Man, and he, he claims he has had the infinity bottle for over 30 years, and it's, it's in his will to his children when he dies. Um, I think stuff like that's really cool, and it, it's, it's the most personalized blend you can have, and sometimes it's amazing, and it's the best thing you've ever tasted, and sometimes maybe it's terrible, and it always works itself out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know with the concept of the infinity bottle, you put whatever in, right? Sure. Can you kind of give us a little bit of a, like what kind of goes good with what? Like what should we be looking for when when pairing stuff and blending stuff? If we were going to do it that way. To make it not taste like crap. Well, you know, <laughs> whiskey's so delicious, <laughs> it's really hard to screw up on a blend in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a valid but, point. <laughs> you know, the, the Scottish Isla whiskeys like Laphroaig and Lagavulin and Ardbeg, those are real bulldogs. Mm -hmm. And even if you put like a dropper, an eyedropper into a blend, it's going to overwhelm the flavor. So you're going to you're going to really have to like smoke if you're using those things. Um, you know, if the infinity bottle is getting too sweet, you add rye. If it's getting too boozy, maybe you should add something lower proof. It, it, it's it's really just what what is your profile like? Maybe maybe you do like the smoke from Isla Blends, but you wish they had a, a, a sweeter finish. Well, start adding um, sherry finished uh, uh, whiskey. Uh, start adding Irish whiskey that's a little sweeter. Start adding wheat whiskey. Um, it, it's really you, whatever you can imagine, whatever whatever you think might work. And you can build really tiny blends too, just to kind of screw around. The next time you're drinking at 11 at night and, and watching TV and maybe you have a few things in front of you, you know, mix them together and, and see what happens. See if anything, any, anything fun happens. That's yeah. how a lot of things have been discovered. When you mix them, are you just literally just pouring and pouring and then say you have three and you're pouring? You're not stirring. You're not shaking it up. You're not doing any of that. You're just kind of letting it trickle and letting it go yeah on its own. i mean the, you know the, again there's a lot of a lot of mythos right. in, in in the community how they do it my my friend blake ryber he believe it or not he puts his blends into a vitamix he believes that aerating them really blends them together okay. that guy from california california gold he believes you really have to shake the bottle aggressively I don't know. That kind of seems like old wives' tales to me, but I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. They they both make better blends than I do. Sure. I uh, I think personally, 
putting them together in a little shake works. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. That's so cool. And, and, and thank you for answering that question because, you know, I, I would always want to know like, you know, what, what, should go with what and, and you, make, you make a great point you know if it tastes this way you can add some rye if it tastes too bold you can you can sweeten it up and 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 kind of make it your own personal blend i'm gonna try to do some right with with the holidays coming up i'm i got i got a good uh, nine well 130 days i think till, till the end of the year so, yeah. so 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 with the holidays coming up i i got a good 90 day head start to kind of screw around with 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 with, with some stuff you know well and then, yeah another nice thing is you, you'll think of the craziest idea in your head. Wow, I wonder if anyone's ever done this on planet Earth. And then you Google it, and yes, a lot of <laughs> smart, talented people have already done it. Right, so right. It's, it's almost virtually impossible these days to kind of invent uh, a, a new idea. Every time I think I've come up with a, a genius idea for a new infusion or fat wash or blend, some some guy on the Internet's already done it before, and I can kind of you know, live on his shoulders and let him have already screwed up to tell me how to do it best mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh i guess chapter one is called stock in the house so i guess stock that house. that that's how they're gonna start so um we might as well we might as well con con continue on that subject well what are your thoughts um as far <laughs> as if someone wanted to get started um yeah when, when they're well, stocking I, their house you know the questions are how much money do you have <laughs> how much space <laughs> do you have and uh, how mad is your wife going to be when the house is all of a sudden full of booze like my house is? Um, <laughs> or your husband. I'm not Baby, I'm collecting. Just, I'm collecting. I'm not drinking all of this. I'm collecting it. Right? This, this is my job. Um, <laughs> you know, she hasn't paid for a drink in a decade. So, um, yeah, you know, it's it's you got to figure out what you what you like. A lot of guys, you probably see this in the cigar world, too. They're they're just starting to dip their toes into whiskey and they want to go from I literally don't own a bottle to now I own Pappy and all the unicorn bottles. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's ridiculous to me. Just there's lots of great cheaper priced stuff that you can start figuring out what your palate is, uh, what you actually like. Don't just shell out a thousand dollars for your bottle of Pappy because everyone else drinks it. Maybe you like something that's, that's cheaper and, and not as fancy. Um, you know, uh, mo most people start with probably a bourbon, you know, a lot of people do like Pappy and makers because they're wheat bourbons. They're, they're a little sweeter, a little mm -hmm. less aggressive. It's a, it's a nice way to start. Um, Scotches obviously are a little more challenging to a lot of people, especially especially the Isla single malts. But then there are the the real sherry backed uh, um, scotches like Macallan that that's mm. a very easy mm. drinker for a lot of people and and pairs well with cigars too. Yeah, um, it, it's it's really what 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 do you like? Um, the best way to do it's just to go to a whiskey bar and start instead of buying full bottles, start trying one ounce samples figuring what you like. Eventually, you'd probably like to have a bourbon or two, a rye, mm -hmm. maybe a few scotches, and, and then go from there. You also got to figure out, how are you drinking it? Do you like it neat? Do you like it on ice? Do you yeah. like to make Manhattans or old fashions? Mm. That's going to that's mm -hmm. change what you're collecting. Yeah. And then sometimes, you know, you just want a bottle because it looks cool on your shelf, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Ma yeah. We, we can do a whole segment on the marketing, right? Of the marketing yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, I got. I just got a text from my little brother, right? He's, he's, he's 10 years younger than me. He's on vacation, actually, in Hilton Head. And okay. Uh, he he said, uh, make me make me a custom whiskey blend. He wants it for Christmas. So there you go. I'm already starting my Christian shopping, Aaron. Thanks. You know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it's a great way to do it. Hell like, yeah. I'm, a, that's a great. A, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> here's a custom blend I have. I don't even remember what's in it. You, but you got to go the other way now. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. But you can go. You can go online and and make your own labels. Yep. You can buy your own. Um, whatever these are called seals and, seals, you know, seals. Yeah, yeah, yeah yep yeah now you have a, a one of a kind whiskey blend to to give to people nice nice how do you personally keep keep track of what you're doing like, like me like i journal a lot like you know like i i usually have a little gray book that has my little story geeks journal all my security weekly duties and stuff like that so i would have to write everything down all right, because uh, real life gets in the way, and I'm scatterbrained in real life, and and there's a lot going on up here, 
right? Some good, some bad, right? And, and so, you know, like, like, what do you do to keep track of what you're doing? Or are you just, are you just at this point, are you just on cruise control and just rocking it? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's kind of think about the way you cook. Are you more like a baker type that measures everything? Or are you like me? I, I, I don't use recipes. I just start cooking and figuring it out. That's not the best way to blend. You know, when, when I'm doing events uh, across the nation, signing books, I'll have a lot of nerds come up to me with their with their little books, and they've meticulously <laughs> write down every word you're saying, right? Well, they've done every iteration of their blends. So once they hone in on something, they got it. Yeah. Me, me, I'm a little sloppier. I'm a little lazier. A little this, a little that. The problem is, if you nail it, you forget what you did, and you have sure. to kind of reverse <laughs> engineer it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think your way. I think the journaling everything way is the better way. But I kind of do it in a more uh, jazz style of, of just mixing and matching and, and hoping uh, something great comes from it. Well, like you said, it can't suck, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny. I wrote a book because uh, about a lot of this stuff because whiskey is so resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, if you mix it together, if you infuse it, it's still whiskey and it's still pretty damn good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, that that. It, it, it it's just an exciting journey and it just adds to you know who knows if you were if you're a stogie geek stogie geek listener at home thinking about doing this who knows you you end up start talking to someone and then you, next thing you know you might have your little club going on and then you you can compare notes because everyone's palate's different just like in the world of cigars for sure and everybody has different tastes and do you blend any of your blends with like like um uh, specific meals or do you kind of use them as cordials afterwards or or i guess it would um, depend on what you're drinking right yeah yeah you know because because like i'm i'm very like i don't like to smoke and eat right like i will net i when i like when i go to smoker dinners you know for a cigar fundraiser like i will go smoking a cigar finish it like 20 minutes when the meal starts eat Okay, and then and then so for the I don't know twenty some odd years I've been I've been uh, uh, with cigars, right? I think it's like twenty four, twenty five here in the industry plus smoking. But you know it's like, you know like like people have their own different things where where they like to have a blend of what it's supposed to be, but not, might not want the experimental. Have you done any like food uh, food pairings with 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 some of the stuff? Yeah. Um... You know, I've never made a blend intentionally to pair with food. And, and mm -hmm. I, I typically drink beer with food, quite okay. frankly. Yep. Uh, whiskey can obviously torch your palate. It's very aggressive. So unless, you know, if you're eating a delicate fish, whiskey's going to totally just bash through it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to act like I don't drink whiskey while eating. and But but typically I, I'm going to drink a Pilsner or IPA with food and, and have the whiskey by itself afterwards. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but – you know, there you you can certainly pair whiskey with food. There's the final chapter in the book has has some has some recipes for actually cooking with whiskey. Mm. Um, there's a there's um, like a, 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 a scotch brine lox in there, smoked salmon. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a chef in New York who makes a, a whiskey dry aged steak mm. that's pretty bonkers. Um, so you'd obviously probably want whiskey paired with that. But when I'm at home, I am usually drinking beer with, with my dinner or maybe a, a cocktail. I, I typically save the whiskey, especially the great whiskey for my dessert. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you have a section, a quick section here. Uh, uh, your words, not mine. You ain't <laughs> getting any pappy. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And then and then, you know, you kind of have like the 15 year olds and the bottles produced per year and the retail price and the black market price. And of course, you know, like, like I don't know, like with with Pappy is is tremendously popular here in the cigar culture. Right. Sure. It's like everybody flocks to that. I'm sure it's in other cultures, too. I'm just not as exposed as I am to, to the level of stogie geeks. Then you take it through. Stop calling it Pappy. Can you elaborate on that stuff um, for, uh, for us there? Yeah. So, well, Buffalo Trace distills Pappy Van Winkle. Mm -hmm. um, Pappy 
Pappy is not a distillery. It's a it's a it's a brand name, <laughs> right? That that Buffalo Trace owns. There there it, there was a Pappy Van Winkle, and there is a Julian Van Winkle who who uh, uh, owns the brand name, but uh, Buffalo Trace distills it. And there are let's see six six Van Winkle products, mm-hmm. and some are Pappies mm-hmm. and some are not. I'm I'm. I was being a little intentionally pedantic and assholeish in the book about that, but it drives me nuts when people call the 10 and 12 year old Van Winkles pappy. Mm. Um, not cause I, not cause I really care more because it's all part of this, this culture of trying to flex that brand you, name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have yeah. a brand name. Yeah. And the funny thing is you're flexing and it's not even, you, you don't even really have it. Yeah, yeah. Pappy starts at Pappy 15, and then there's a Pappy 20 and a Pappy 23, and, there's, and there was a, a 25 recently, too. That's Pappy. Everything else is just a Van Winkle product, um, which are fine. Some of them are very good. <laughs> I'm not even going to be a contrarian and say they're not good. It's just uh, this whole just obnoxious culture around Pappy. Uh, it, it, dri- it drives most of the, the – the whiskey geeks who have been in the industry for a long time bananas Nuts. yeah 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 uh, uh i'm i'm a little ass ass assholeish here <laughs> on still your geeks as well happens in the cigar industry right you we, yeah. we we interview brand new cigar company and it's a cigar and um, and and they tell us yeah you know it's got this blend it's from nicaragua and we're at the factory and it's like you don't own a factory nesta placencia <laughs> is rolling all your stuff Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Or you don't own a factory, Alec Bradley's rolling your stuff. You know what I mean? And it's done at the Alec and, and believe me, I can name drops and piss off a lot of people. You know, and 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 and, and you know, and I I always kinda especially like if if they happen to be here in studio and they sit next to me and then they're, they're just going, it's like you, you, you listen, you you, you 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 did a couple of test blends, you marketed a name and you're rocking and rolling. I get it, right? I get it. But, you know, it, it, it to me, it's kind of disgraceful to the rollers who kind of take the time to experiment with the cigar blend and say, hey, you know, if you're this company and you want to offer this product as not our brand name but someone else's, you know what I mean? So, so I guess it happens in your industry too, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think just about every industry that has passionate consumers, there's going to be – you know, businessmen that are trying to bilk the uh, less knowledgeable. Yeah. Um, luckily, most people are starting to realize that, hey, a distill, a quote unquote distillery just popped up in my town and they immediately have a 15 year old whiskey. How's that possible? They didn't exist last month and now they have 15 year old whiskey. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> happens in the cigar world, right? Oh, I have this age 15 years. So you mean to tell me that the people in the industry, uh, the plantation just sat on this for you, like you called, right. like you called them 15 years ago and, and did the oh, no, it's a special plan, blah, blah, blah. and then yeah. you know, um, we had a fascinating interview with Manuel and Noah from La Aurora to uh, La Aurora Cigars, and he gave us pointers here on the show of when the tobacco's not not ready and the type of feeling that you get when, I, and, and there are a lot of times where I smoke a cigar and usually in our second segment where we do sticks of the week we get a little bit more geeky about rapid mind the filler and I just say yeah it's a good cigar but the, the tobacco's not ready you know what I mean oh but it's it's aged eight, eight years you haven't even been in business eight years and to bring back your point of the pappy like wannabe syndrome just using the name a lot of bars will get their hands on that non traditionally pappy stuff and just yeah. call it pappy and blow through it at ridiculous prices and like you said they 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 sell it out so that that's why i think like for any stogie geeks that really wants to get into this picking up the book is is a smart move because it really will be in your rotation for at least 30 40 years of your life for sure <laughs> Hopefully, you know, well, absolutely. I mean, there's so much knowledge in it, you know, when, when I was going through it. And, and again, it happens in the security field and it happens in the cigar where we get tons of literature and stuff sent to us. And, and, and you know, when, when I was going through it, I was like, wow, like, Pappy, like, I did not know that I thought it, I knew that it wasn't, I knew that Pappy didn't have their own d- distillery. I knew that, right? Yeah. I, kn- I knew that concept, but I did not know that. They were they were selling pappy that wasn't pappy, like tra- tra- traditional pappy. You know. Yeah, I mean Buffalo Trace isn't trying to to necessarily bilk anyone. It, it's the bar owners. You put pappy tenure on a menu. Yep. 
you can charge more than if you put, you know, Van Winkle lot B on the menu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll... I, I, you know, I, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. It's, it's like calling your, your, your steak Kobe beef instead of, you know, whatever it, it really is. Great it's... D, but edible. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Drew, do you have a question? I, I try not to hog all, all of the time. No, no, no. I'm just, you know, like, you know, for me, like here in Texas, you know, a lot of the guys, uh, same thing as some of the restaurants, uh, some of the restaurants, high quality restaurants will, 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 uh, uh, visit. Um, you know, it's interesting when they have a pappy, you know, shelf and yeah, I'm looking at it and I, yeah. yeah. And I'm there with my phone and my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just trying to read that bottle up there and just really, <laughs> you know, cause I actually belong to a pappy club. No kidding. Uh, yes. And so, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll take a photo of it and send it out there and I'll get a feedback on it and they'll tell me and educate me, you know, what that is exactly. And it's very, uh, educational, but, uh, as you said, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're in the business of food and beverage, uh, and people want that, I mean, you're not, it's not that you're being dishonest or your integrity is, is in question. It's just that that's the way the bottle's labeled. So they market it that way. Uh, yeah. you know, in, in their menu. So, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, when I was reading your, uh, your book and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That does make sense for, of what this person was telling me, uh, yeah. about the Pappy Van Winkle deal. Absolutely. So what are you going to say in your Pappy club now, Drew, when you go, man, <laughs> guys are all full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, maybe it's a Van Winkle club now. Yeah, yeah. It's, yes, exactly. You know, and it's interesting because I, I told one, one of my, one of the members there, I said, you know, I'm going to be on a, I'm going to be talking to this, uh, whiskey hack, uh, hacker. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we read his book. <laughs> and, what they uh, say, be honest, Drew. Uh -oh. We're always honest. They're on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they, they said it was, uh, it was definitely very informative. Uh, but you know, for most people, they're just chasing that, that infinity, you know, they're just, are that, that unicorn. And yeah. so they don't they don't really invest or divulge, divulge into the you know aspect of really researching it. Uh, they see it, they grab it, and they go, and that's pretty much it. So uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you're if you're someone who doesn't spend all day thinking about whiskey like I do, and you just enjoy it on occasion, the the thing you're gonna know is Pappy, and the thing you're gonna probably know in Scotch is Macallan or Johnny Walker Blue, and and exactly. when you have some money and you're ready to ball out, that's what you're going to buy. You're not going to know the nerdy, esoteric thing to buy. And quite frankly, you know, your friends that you're buying around for or your followers on Instagram that you're trying to brag about what you're drinking tonight aren't going to know either. So it, it's it's all in good fun. But, uh, yeah. you know, the book's kind of telling people that you 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 can drink better, you can drink more interesting, and you can certainly drink cheaper. <laughs> Mm. Yes. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. I, I I like to experiment with 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 some of the the unknowns. I think, unfortunately, at least here in Rhode Island, um, there are two distributors, so we are limited to uh, what us consumers can kind of get our hands on. You know what I mean? Yeah. In regards to that, so when I do some 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 traveling, I I always try to like a, to to take a peruse around. Mm -hmm. And kind of see if there's stuff that I can't get at home and, and whatnot. I don't, I don't really pay attention to to like the prices and and stuff like that. You know, I just, you know, if it's if it's in my my, my range of of what I feel that I want to go with and, and 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 think that you know I'm I'm gonna like it. Uh, one of the things that 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 I do like and what I've found out and I want to encourage the Stogie Geek listener to consider this technique is go to a tasting. And have mm -hmm. like so if your local liquor store or your local uh, you know boutique liquor store or you know not not a regular package store where you're gonna get you know uh, Corona readers and all that stuff right like <laughs> one that really tries to have an educational component to flock to those I've done that in the craft beer which has yes. led me which has led me to destinations like Maine I mean there, there's like 94 breweries in Maine there's probably 34 in Rhode Island. 
I believe, and craft beer is on the rise. But but having tried it had led me to different destinations and then going there and then tasting it. And then, you know, getting a, a, a flight or, you know, uh, I've gone to uh, wine tastings as well, like, like that as well, where, you know, you could try that and you're like, wow, this is super good. And then, you know, I, I usually judge it by, like, my first 10 I, samples I try. After that... <laughs> Like after that, you're just like you're just like all right, yeah, this is wicked good, and you you buy that right because you forgot what you had on sample two or something like that. But not me. I I, I try to take notes, and I'm going back to the to the station and 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 and, and trying to figure that out, and then purchase that. There, there's a place in Rhode Island, it's in Massachusetts, which is right over the border, um, called y- uh, Yankee Spirits that has all of that. And so I encourage yeah. the Stogie Geek listener to go to the website of that type of, 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 of store. They will have an email list. Log on, sign up for the email list. They always let you know when the tastings are at. And go to a couple of tastings because that's really the, the most cost-effective and cheapest way that, that you're going to start to kind of build a uh, target as to what it is that you want to purchase. For sure. Yeah, because uh, yeah. how Yankee Spirits does it is they always pick a charity – it's a five dollar donation. Everybody gets in, and it goes to the charity. And then all the all the the distributors set up a little booth, and they give you like a little history, and you and you kind of go yeah. around. And it's in the store, so it's like you. So like they they never do anything that you can't purchase that day or that night. So that's a super cool way to spend a couple hours. You know, definitely suggest you do it before dinner. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> after dinner. I've done. I've made. <laughs> I've made the, the, a couple of mistakes doing it before dinner when it comes to whiskey or scotches, and you're like, whoa, okay, whoa, I need to eat. You know? Where's the snack section at, right? <laughs> can I, you know, so can I get that bag of Doritos that's over there by the cash register? Yeah. <laughs> and then your palate shot. It's a nightmare. You know, so you know one of the things I wanted to say <clears throat> to Aaron is that I'm actually trying the bone marrow uh, <clears throat> fusion. So that's, uh, I think oh, my nice. wife has cut, she hasn't found the jar yet, but... Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm trying that because I have a lot of, uh, you know, world famous barbecue uh, establishments yeah. here, and so they'll give me the cut of their uh, of the of the of the bone with a little bit of fat on it still, and uh, marbled, and uh, they'll tell me, yeah, go ahead and and, and and sear it in the pan, get that get that uh, the natural juices out of that, and then cut that bone marrow in half, and then and then put it in your favorite. Uh, you know, whiskey or bourbon or uh, gin, and and try that and, and and see what what comes out of that. So that's that's pretty cool. You're gonna, wow, man! You're stepping up your game, Andrew. Yes, Freaking I am. Bone marrow. <laughs> I'm over here gonna screw around with bacon tomorrow morning. You know what I mean? I'm getting my, my my six six pieces or eight pieces of bacon, thinking I'm accomplishing something, and you're out there getting bone marrow. He's yeah, working well, on my, his graduate degree already. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Drew. Well, my wa- on my wife's side, I'm going to go ahead and do that with her with some of the wine. Like the, uh, There's a couple of sections in the book about wine because mm. uh, my wife loves uh, wine. So uh, I figured if I entice her with that and then she sees my weird laboratory set up in the uh, kitchen, she, <laughs> she'll, you know, like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> now you'll have an activity. You'll be able to compare notes. Make sure, Drew, when you do that, kind of yes. take some pictures and journal. I am. Because what we'll do for a future episode is we'll compare notes and do a, a, and do a test. You know, Definitely. And, you know, and stuff like that. So yeah, that's super cool. Aaron, is there anything else that you want to add, uh, you know, as far as next steps or how to get started or or um, how some of the Stogie Geeks listeners can follow you? You're on social media. You're on Facebook, link, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, Instagram. Yeah. Do you post any kind of experimental stuff and stuff like that? Or, yeah, sometimes Instagram is probably the most productive way to follow me. I don't tweet a lot because that just leads to uh, people hating you. Um, right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you you can follow me on on any media, and I post a lot of stuff. You know, I'd I'd say if a lot of this stuff we've been talking about sounds intimidating to you, uh, it, it's really not. the The book has really step by step instructions, so. Even if it seems really hard to make a bacon whiskey or a bone marrow whiskey, it's it's something you can do in your house pretty comfortably. And I really haven't heard of a lot of people screwing these things up. There's a few complex recipes in there, complex in the sense that they're time consuming. Uh, not that you're not going to have the tools or be able to acquire the ingredients to do them, but you know it's a it's a fun way to spend a Saturday and Sunday. And as you mentioned with 
with the fall and the holiday season coming up, it's a it's a real nice way to make one of a kind stuff for Christmas parties or Thanksgiving or you know to take to a football tailgate. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. For you Stogie Geeks listeners who are listening to this on audio, you can email me at Joe H at StogieGeeks dot com. I will send you the link to Aaron's website in the book that's available on all of the book media platforms that are out there, or you can just throw Hacking Whiskey into your browser and you'll be able uh to uh, get that there and if you are going to take the liberty and start to do some some steps in that don't forget to take pictures and tag yeah. uh stogie geeks myself or if you want to follow aaron um just don't give him any hate speech on twitter he doesn't like that <laughs> all right <laughs> there's enough hate on that on on that platform yeah you know absolutely. i just started tweeting because i guess it's pretty it's it's very popular platform here in the cybersecurity field and yeah. I, I fought it for a year of i was like no nah, i'll just use the security weekly whatever they post is fine and and it, 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 it's pretty neat you know and actually social media to for, for you listeners at home that's how i met drew I mean, Drew. Drew started uh, 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 joining me in in my Bloody Mary quest with 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 cigars, and he was tagging me in a bunch of pictures. And everywhere he tagged me, and it looked very warm. So oh, you yeah. know, <laughs> it had a nice background. <laughs> I was like, okay, he's somewhere warm where where I want to be. You know, he did it in right. the winter time. So for those of you who are in warm climates in the winter, and you tag Stoey Geeks, we'll pay attention to those a little bit more for sure, because uh, th- those twenty three degree days are not fun. You know, but, <laughs> but, but I met Drew through social media from Stogie Geeks, you know, yes. and, and then we just started talking, had some dialogue and, and then there you go. So it's pretty crazy. So Aaron, uh, um, right quick, take us through any, some of your other books and, um, where, uh, what topics are they on as well? Well, if I can continue to be self-promoting, I actually have a new book coming out on September 24th. Okay. Um, so if they and go to your website, so happen, they'll be I able happen to... to have it beside me. Okay. Called Gather Around Cocktails. Look at that. Um, this is cocktails for occasions. Nice. Christ, Christmas cocktails, Thanksgiving cocktails. There's a lot of uh, large format cocktails. There's a cocktail you can make inside an igloo cooler and take it to a football tailgate. You we know, did that in college. We called it Big Lou. Because because uh, because yeah. uh, I had the igloo and we actually we uh, uh over, I had some friends that were over at uh, Providence College as well. We used and this is back in the early '90s when like PC basketball was like rock star, right? Like you know Abdul Abdullah, Dickie Simpkins, you know what I mean Troy Brown, you know then yeah. they went to the Chicago Bulls. Like so like when we and we were going to parties and we would bring Big Lou and we did a Big Lou and we dressed him up like a Hawaiian because of course we're in the Northeast. So his name was Big Lou <laughs> and we always poured something in and we did a different drink you know yeah yeah so yeah so absolutely so you can do mass stuff so so that book is gonna have stuff for cocktail parties uh like party of 10 party of 20 or well so this book is definitely less geeky than hacking whiskey um this is you know the the only holiday on the calendar that really has an official cocktail is christmas with eggnog you Mm. know what's the official cocktail of july 4th so this book kind of proposes and has recipes for just about every holiday and or occasion on the calendar, an Oscar watching party, a Super Bowl party. Um, we all know what the official cocktail of the Kentucky Derby is, mm-hmm. but I have a, a mint julep recipe in there. Um, nice. It's really all throughout the year, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, there's a, there, there's a new a- occasion and, and the <laughs> book has a recipe to make uh, a cocktail for – a large group of people that are hopefully going to come over to your house or invite you to theirs. Nice. What's the official cocktail of the 4th of July in your book? Do you know? Yep. Yes. It's this cool cocktail that's – it's built inside a watermelon, actually. Whoa. The watermelon is the oh, is the right. punch pitcher. We did that um, in college, too. We, we stuck a bottle of something into the watermelon. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Cool. So it's called Watermelon, watermelon Punch. punch. Nice. Yeah. yeah. The vast majority of these are created by professional bartenders. I think I created about five to ten. But, you know, these are tried and true recipes, uh, interesting, fun, kind of wacky recipes. They're fun for all ages. You don't have to be a real geek. They're not just whiskey cocktails either. They're everything uh, under the rainbow. 
Awesome. Awesome. So I was going to say here in Texas, during the two weeks of winter, if we should ever get that two weeks of winter. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> He's got to keep bragging. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, when we do have those winters, uh, some of our our favorite pubs, they'll do a, uh, you know, like a uh, habanero pepper. They'll do the pepper infuse it. Infuse, uh, infuse whiskeys or uh, yeah. uh, tequilas, and man, those are man, those are fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like those for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love tequila. We, yeah. we, yeah. and then after that, we can read your other book, uh, uh, how not how to fail. How to fail. How to fail was my first book. It's a novel. Came out oh, in 2010. Yeah. Uh, full of some foul language. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I wrote that when I was 29. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fun novel I haven't read in a long while. What's so, that book uh, about? What's I that hope about? it's still good. <laughs> What's that book it about? Is. Uh, it's a it's a it's a satire on a self help guide. It's a self hurt guide. It's about a uh, <laughs> a, a character in New York, a twenty something who who you know keeps failing in life. He loses his job. He gets dumped by his girlfriend. His landlord kicks him out for not paying rent and kind of through failing in life, he kind of learns what, what the real uh, meaning of happiness and success is, of course. Wow. That sounds... Yes. You read that, Drew? <laughs> I'm starting to read it. I actually got some excerpts this morning from a friend of mine Damn, who has the book. up in me like every freaking episode. He came, prepa- he came prepared. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I, I started these episodes and I'm like, oh, heck no, I got to get this book because... Yeah, after a few cocktails, you know, part of the relaxation uh, process that I go through on a daily basis, you know, I like something funny, you know. Yeah, so, well, so. that was the intention. That's so awesome. Thank, oh, yeah. thank you for all the royalty dollars I'm going to get this month. That's awesome. You're welcome. That's awesome to hear. <laughs> um, do you still write for uh, Wine uh, Wine Pair? Uh, Vine Pair? Yeah, absolutely. I got a got about one story a month uh, on there. Not all whiskey stories, but yep. You know, I kind of write about the wackier aspects of drinking culture, um, and I have a story coming up in the next uh, week or two. I actually, I actually just had a – my last story was about a bar uh, – it was about uh, Newport, Rhode Island, where they're obsessed with uh, doing Grand Marnier shots. So I don't know if that was you, you? Have noticed that. Yeah. That was, okay. All right. Because I, I – I, uh, full disclosure, I subscribe to their list, and if you go through yeah. my social media – Probably even up to last week when they did uh, um, what beers to mix with your Bloody Mary mix. Yeah. I get from from um, uh, uh, Vine Pair. I get their email yeah. list. It's like two emails a day you get. Super cool yeah. articles. But I remember that with with with, with Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How they're, how they're super obsessed with this drink, right? Yeah. Take us through that story. Yeah, so I mean, if most people are familiar with Grand Marnier, it's it's they're probably familiar with it for, you know, always noticing it, never drinking it. Right. Maybe maybe you put it in a margarita, or you know, maybe you you remember your grandma drinking it in the the sixties. Um, Coffee. You certainly don't know a lot of people who take shots of it, yep. but in Newport, Rhode Island, they're obsessed with taking what they call shorty shots. Yep. They're one ounce shots of it. And if you go to most bars in Newport and say, give me a shorty, they'll give you a shot of Grand Marnier. And if you go to most any other city on planet Earth and ask for a shorty, you'll, uh, well, you'll, you'll probably get kicked out of the bar. Yeah, I live <laughs> but, um, two towns from Newport. I live in Bristol, Rhode Island. And, oh, nice. and then you go Portsmouth and then boom, it goes over to Newport. And I'm in Newport at least once a month, like a, all, all, all year round. Super cool place. And what I did notice after reading that article is if you go anywhere else uh, in Newport, Grand Marnier is on the bottom shelf. Yeah. It's, it's usually never there. We've only mixed it here from, from my circle of friends outside of the cigar world. Like we put it in our sangria. You know what I mean? Yeah. To kind of, to kind of cut yeah. this, the uh, sangria and stuff like that um, there. But I noticed that when you go to Newport, ever since your article, I've no- because I was in Newport last weekend as well, in the weekend yeah. before, and and I noticed that the Grand Marnier is uh, it's not on the top shelf, but it's visible on the, like the regular shelf that has like the regular beers. It's right next to Jack or something like that. It's crazy. Yeah, I think they. You know, it's not a massive town. It's a, it's a. I think fifty thousand people live there. Yep. They go through more Grand Marnier than than New York City, I believe. It's it's a it's a real obsession. It's the official drink of the town, and 
that was uh, what my article was about. I wonder if it's a cheap shot. I'm 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 gonna do one just for nostalgia. Yeah, it's it's about four or five bucks. So four, it's, it's yeah. not it's not a high end shot. Because you know where I was going. I love to collect parking tickets in Newport, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Ah, because if if you park, it's twenty bucks, right? But if you get a ticket, it's it's twenty it's twenty five dollars. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's not but bad. But if I park, it's twenty dollars today, right? But right. if I get a ticket, it's twenty dollars. I'm sorry, it's twenty five dollars thirty days from now, right? <laughs> and, my, and my girl's always like, "Why do you do that?" I was like, "No, we're paying for pocket. We're gonna we're, we're gonna get access to where we're gonna go, and we're gonna pay twenty five dollars." And I am already at four tickets this summer. They're all paid. That's pretty good. Yeah, because think about it. I would pay because because I have a uh, in two weeks my firstborn son will be a year old, right? So I like to park at the carriage. We have a limited time when we're eating, going out to eat. You know, I don't want to sure. park on one side of town and, and walk all the way to where I gotta go. Or, and plus, all the parking lots are full, but all the right. meters are empty. So I put the I put the thing in, and sometimes you don't get caught because I go I go so, sometimes and, and and sometimes you're like man. You know, I kind of hit the lottery. I was here for four hours, supposed to be here for three, and guess what? I didn't get a ticket. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus. I, I call that stimulating the economy. You know what I mean? We're gonna there you go. go. We're gonna go out and and stimulate the economy and do some some some. Sh- what are they called? Shorties. 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 Yeah. I'm gonna go have a shorty this weekend for sure. They're also, you know, they're lower uh, alcohol. Grand Marnier is only, I think, twenty percent or so. So yeah, you know, it's a it's a nice uh, little boost of alcohol to uh not knock you under the table just keep you keep you going all day yeah 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 plus new has frozen drinks man they have those dock and stormies yeah yeah uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, and they make them frozen this time of year super cool oh yeah you know what i love about newport because it's such a it's such a tourist town and, and like a water town it's right on the water and everything when you go there in right. the winter it's like valet parking you can go any. You can go anywhere you want. And just whoop, valet, go in and out. You can you can literally like drive your car like right on the cobblestone street. No one's there. It's perfect. Wonderful. Yeah, you know, it's a good time. Aaron, thank you for joining us on Stogie Geeks. Please keep in yeah. touch with us. Any updates that you want us to get out uh, via our social media on your new book release or whatever, please send it my way via email. And if you want to come back and talk about that book once it gets going, maybe around the holidays, uh, let me know yeah. your, your schedule and we can put you in rotation. It'd be great Absolutely. to hear from you. Absolutely. Yeah, let's talk some eggnog in December for sure. Awesome. And then Definitely. Drew will be talking about how warm it is where he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be doing Story Geeks in my turtleneck sweater, right? And, 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 yeah. and then there yeah. you go. Aaron, thank you for joining us on Stogie Geeks. Stogie Geeks listeners, stay tuned. In our next segment, Drew and I are going to talk about Sticks of the Week. We'll be right back.